I never saw the car until it showed up here like this. Handwritten journals for 1974 and 75 here. When I would hit, I've seen those rib things way over there like that. And I told them, do not clean it. In 1975, this car sitting on this trailer, I wouldn't be the person I am today if that hadn't happened. So we're here in Batesville, Arkansas at the Mark Martin dealership slash museum with Mark Martin who I guess is strangely enough a frequent viewer of the channel that's how we ended up here what do you got going on here well we've got uh, kind of a museum 40 here years of sort of my stock car racing history is here come on in let's have a look all right how many of your fire suits did you keep how did that did you keep them knowing that you wanted to hang them up someday or did they just have them kind of kept them uh tried that tried to have one of ever flavor whatever it was obviously if it was just a one race deal or something like that maybe i didn't have but that was one thing that i did try to collect where a lot of the trophies i gave away back in the day just for instance when arlene and i got married in 1984 we moved seven times in the first five years we were married Wow. And after the third move, you know, and some of those were apartments and stuff. And after the third move, all my trophies were broke and broken and everything. And I had them in the under, crawl space underneath the ha house in North Carolina, I think it was. And I was just pissed. And I threw them all in the dumpster. Wow. And that was 1984. And so I don't have anything that predates 84 and going forward from 84 anytime I want to race all I was worried about is getting the check you know I wasn't worried about the trophy I didn't have any place to put the trophies they were a burden to me at the time I always gave them away you know friends owners somebody at the race record whatever well let's walk if you want to see the very beginnings the most embarrassing part of this whole place to me is my journals uh, the first two years I raced, we had a lot of things going on, a lot of issues in the pits, a lot of interesting things. And so I, I, hand, I had my handwritten journals for 1974 and 75 here. The feature race, we were in second. Um, that might have been, I don't see the date there, but that might have been like the second race I, I raced. Said so Nolan grabbed the plug wire and got shit out of them is that what it is <laughs> yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff you'll find in there yeah yeah or uh blew up second lap heber springs april 13th yeah so this is the very beginning of my career less maybe the third race but you can see i'm running second and third right out of the gate uh with the feature races they usually had three uh three heats in a feature around here back then but here we won $33 at Heber Springs. So we get just a little deeper and we, we start winning some races and getting first place. How did you keep all this stuff? I, I don't know exactly how we did that. Uh, I kept the journals. Somehow or another, they were piled up with, I think my mother's kept a scrapbook, which if we move over here, you'll see the pictures and she did this and you remember though well you don't know you're too young <laughs> the, the, the polaroid you know instamatic or whatever photographs of my very first race car and our first trailer that we built and we'll talk about the trailer a little bit more later she kept these scrapbooks all the way up until i made it to to nascar this is an in interesting one so we built the car uh in the trucking company shop uh, just drug a 55 Chevy out of the woods and gutted it out and put a roll cage in it and we're going to race the six-cylinder class. So Lenati cams in Memphis, we took the motor to Lenati and had them, you know, build up the motor. I remember that. And so we went out to practice the first night and I maybe made four or five laps and broke a rod and you can see the, the shop towel hanging out of the oil pan. <laughs> So we were in deep, deep trouble. Uh, weren't gonna be able to race. And we went to the local hero, hero here, Wayne Brooks, who won everything at the time. And he had a old, wore out, standby backup engine. And we made a deal with him 
uh, on that engine. And uh, so it was reliable and <laughs> we got a lot of experience with it. Uh, and Wayne B Brooks was kind of the save of the day. From your dad's uh, trucking company desk. That's oh, really cool. wow. Yeah, see, I don't even look at this stuff. I don't even know what I have here, really, to be honest with you. It's invisible to me. So the third year I raced, we built a late model. And my dad was all about horsepower. So he had Lenati build a 496 cubic inch big block. <laughs> and I'm uh, 16 years old and 110 pounds. Is that it, the car that didn't have power steering? Yeah, it was a beast. <laughs> It was a beast, uh, and we quickly had to figure out how to junkyard, uh, go to the junkyard and put power steering in it. But it was a pretty cool old car, pretty neat. It is good looking. Is that kind of like the origin of your signature bird paint scheme? Did it evolve? Yes, it, that, that's pretty much, that's really it when it was orange and white. The first car was just orange, but all my late models after from 76 on were orange and white. Yeah, with the white on the roof. Um, one of the things that's interesting, if you go back to the podcast, is the, the trucks. Each year, I think the story is as interesting about the tow truck as it is about the race car itself. Um, and this is the third year evolution. The first, uh, the first two years, it was just a pickup truck. And you know, with a with towing a trailer, but then we did the four door truck with the ramp truck part. And of course my dad was all about speed, so it had a four fifty four in it. Uh and then he put a double stick transmission, some kind of <laughs> two stick transmission in that thing, and of course we it was all hopped up. And then it wouldn't then it wouldn't stop. So we got some crazy stories about about our haulers. <laughs> in our podcast but before we skip too far forward i'm going to take you back here and, and show you uh, we were not able to get our second race car our first race car our very first race car i think wound up going to a crusher uh, but our second car we were able to get our hands on larry shaw was able to locate the car and was able to restore it uh quite a few years ago and so we we had that car sitting here in the museum and then in 2015 somebody shot me a picture of of this old trailer out in the woods that was all rusted up and said hey isn't this your old trailer and i'm like yeah i gotta have that so hmm. in 2015 i went and got this trailer and uh restored it and put the, the car on it and there's a picture around here somewhere where in 1975 this car sitting on this trailer with my trophies in front of it 40 years later I was able to get the trailer get the car on it put it in here and uh, you know the trailer is really cool because free house trailer axles and and uh, some angle iron and some wood uh, boards and that was our that was our trailer and just used uh, my dad's everyday pickup truck to tow it so that's how we that's how we went racing the first two years didn't it, you restore this yourself I did I did uh, uh, now I did send it out to be powder coated so I didn't do that but yeah I took it all apart personally by myself really with no help and and redid the the, the axle the wheel bearings and everything and, and uh, yeah, I did it. I did it all myself. I needed something to do. I was retired. Uh, so uh, I, I really did enjoy it. Do you remember uh, your routine with this thing where you strapped it down, pulling it on there, what you looked at, like, you know, all that stuff? I, I vaguely remember it. I, I vaguely remember it. I remember more because, because I was as young as I was, my dad and Larry Shaw did the heavier, more important mechanical work. Um, and as I, because I was still going to school, they would work on the car at night and a lot of times I'd go out there in the shop with, and hang with them. And as, as we progressed through the years, I got more and more mechanical. By uh, 78, I was doing, you know, 78 was the first summer that I was 
graduated from high school, so I was out of school. So I was in the shop every day, and we worked every day in the shop. So I became more and more hands-on starting in 78. Uh, I have total photographic memory of 1980 and 1981, and quite a bit on 1979 as well. Those were the years that I was in full sort of command of the car and was doing, you know, I was doing all, I was hanging all the bodies, I was doing the painting, I was doing all the chassis setup. Um, you know, we were designing and redesigning and uh, chassis and development and building trailers and that's really the meat, the real pride of my career is 79, 80, and 81. Those, those three years, you know, I love the cars, uh, you know, uh, NASCAR cars are okay. I didn't build those cars. I didn't hang the body on those cars. I didn't do the setup on those cars. Uh, or in 82, maybe I did, but I wasn't successful. So that's not really important to me because we failed in 1982. But in 1981, uh, we really did some cool, cool stuff. And th those again are in, in the podcast. Yeah, I really like those uh, those episodes. You remember everything down to what springs you had around the whole car and all that stuff. And I'm like, how do you remember that? Like, did you write that stuff down too? No. You no, I could, and, and each year in 79, when I'd go back to the same track in 1980, I'd remember what gear we ran, what setup we ran, and if we needed to do something different. I didn't keep notes, didn't keep setups, didn't write them down. It was all in my head. And I went from track to track to track to track. I don't know how I did it, but and I still remember it. You can show me a picture of a car, actually all the way back from 77. Because you can show me a picture of, of a car on the track, and I'll, in that track it'll jog my memory, and I can tell you the springs, the shocks, the sway bar, the weight distribution within a half a percent, uh, you know, all those, those details. Um, and people ask me, how do you remember that? And I just, my answer to that is, it was important. <laughs> I mean, it meant the difference in winning and not winning, surviving and not surviving in, in the business. I mean, in 77, when, when it dawned on me that I was gonna be able to make a living racing cars, dude, that was, a, that was crazy. I never dreamed that. When I first started driving a race car, it was, I was pretty good at it. And I loved it because I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't play basketball, couldn't play football, wasn't very good at baseball. You know, I wasn't gonna make it in uh, NBA, you know. And so I found something that I was good at. And it really felt good to be, be good at something. Was that year like a turning point for you as a person? Did you have the attention to detail and work ethic that you have now when you were younger? Or did it, was it like a light switch? It was, it was developed, it developed. So the first two years I raced, and really three, the first three years I raced, Larry Shaw and my dad worked on the car every night. And, you know, I'd come in or, or, I, or I wouldn't, but I was a junior in mechanical skills and no fabrication skills, uh, so junior to them, so I, did more watching and listening to them, uh, you know, talk uh, <laughs> than I did, uh, you know, work itself. And as, you know, as I progressed into, I'd really say 78 was the first year. That's when I was full time on the race car. Um, you know, was, I was out of school, wasn't distracted with that, with, with school or homework or whatever. Um, and I had seen the light that I was going to be able to do that for a living. So that's really when the work ethic began. And, uh, and then when we went into 79, I moved from here, from Batesville, up to Dillon's shop in uh, North Liberty, Indiana. And it was just me and Banjo Grimm and David Lovendahl, just the three of us. And we, I mean, we had to work. We worked from you know, seven, seven in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, every day. And it was like a vacation to go to the race, to race, because 
you know, a lot of times you were driving instead of working in the shop or, or whatever. So um, the work ethic was something that developed kind of over, over time and really hit its peak there in 79 and 80. When, uh, when you were listening to your dad and Larry Shaw work on stuff, were they actively trying to teach you things or did you learn by listening to everything they did? I learned by listening. They didn't tap, you know, they didn't talk to me directly. And they spent a lot of time talking about how good they were, how good our cars were. And, you know, uh, I mean, they were real talkers. Oh man, they just, one would try to up the other one. And you know, how we, you know, it was just insane. They were real talk, shit talkers, I'm telling you. It was unbelievable. And uh, it was, and it, it rubbed off on me some because you're a product of your environment. Uh, so I was fairly, you know, cocky in my earlier years uh, until I really had the humbling experience in 1982 that took me completely to my, to my knees. And that changed me. But to give you an idea of how bad it was, this is an uh, embarrassing story. Um, uh, we were going to go in 77, we were going to go out to Las Vegas and run Craig Road Speedway, big race out there. And news, newspaper guy got a hold of Shaw somehow or another, I don't know how, and thought it was me. And Shaw, you know, they, they were, Larry Phillips was the man, I mean, Hall of Fame man here out here, Springfield, Missouri. And he went out there and cleaned their clock. Every time he'd go out west, he'd clean their clock. And so they were talking about, oh, Larry Phillips, can you run with Larry Phillips? He said, we can outrun Larry Phillips on four flat tires. So, <laughs> which was, you know, <laughs> insane. So there, evidently there was an article or something was said that I was the Muhammad Ali of stock car racing. So yeah, you learn your lessons as a young one, as you go go forward I, I, I became very humble uh, especially after that experience and the experience that I went through in 1982 well it's really interesting probably got like a bazillion more questions oh yeah <laughs> I want to show you uh, over here this is probably the biggest milestone in the museum this is JR 10 when we started at Jack Roush uh, racing in 1988 we started numbering the cars from number one. This is the 10th car that we built. It was the first uh, Mike Laughlin front steer car that we ever built. We ran second five times prior to finally getting our first win. In this car, we, we got our first win with JR10 in 1989 at Rockingham. You know, it's so cool uh, that you just did a video on Rockingham Speedway. Uh, and it's fitting that you're here now yeah. with the car that got me my first win. But this is some of the footage from, uh, you know, Victory Lane. And, you know, I didn't even remember. Uh, there's Ryan Pemberton as a 19-year-old tire, tire changer in the, in the photo. And, you know, it's just, uh, there's my dad right above the trophy looking away there. I didn't even remember, remember my dad being there. You know, it's just... <laughs> It's so crazy to see some of this stuff. The story on this car and why this car is even more important than just getting our first win is we retired this car in 1990 because, you know, we continually built new cars and thought we were building better cars. After it was retired for a while, we learned some things on the hanging the bodies and couldn't get a chassis soon enough to get a new body on it, to get it on the racetrack like we wanted, we we're gonna to have to wait. So we grabbed this thing, cut the body off of it, put another body on it, and we did that after a long drought, you know, where we hadn't won any races for, a, a, you know, we we're in a drought period. Brought it back out, won a race again. Hmm. That happened three times and uh, I think it was 93. We rebodied it again, it had been parked and retired and we rebodied it for Phoenix and we went out to Phoenix and I think we, I think we either sat on the pole or outside pole and, and you know, won the race out there. I believe that, I believe that was 93. Uh, you know, so this, this car out of my 35, I, ha I haven't been able to prove it 
exactly for sure. Steve Neal and I think that this car won probably five of the 35 races that we won at Roush Racing together. So this thing is, uh, you know, was very important to, to my career. Wow, so wasn't, wasn't your first win Jack's first win as an owner too? Oh yes. So oh, this yes. is like an important car to him too. Yeah, yeah, see, uh, yeah. I don't even know how I managed to buy it from Jack, but I was able to pry it out of his hands somehow or another. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, when it was in our, it took us two years to get our first win. We were really close to winning uh, Bristol about our fifth race together. But then after that, we, we weren't really in contention to win the rest of the year. But the following year in 89, we were running second and third all the time and really running good. And it was just a matter of time till we got our first win. Do you remember any uh, interesting details or dents or holes or anything in this thing that have always kind of been there, anything cool like that? Or has it been restored to the point of only knowing what it is from a number? You know, I just know it as, as JR-10, um, but I could tell you, you know, we ran a, uh, at Rockingham when we won that race in 1989, we had a 1700 in the right front and a 1200 in the left front, a pair of 325s in the rear. And I think that I think the track bar was nine and a half, ten and a half. So it's weird, you know. I can't remember what I had for lunch today, <laughs> but you know, I remember crazy things like that. This thing's cool. So this thing was ran from '88 to '93 in various on and off configurations. It ran from '89 to '93 with various different bodies on it. Yeah, I mean the same style body but we were learning all the time to push this over pull that up you know you could do a lot more in the gray areas back at that time you know there weren't as many templates and so we were we were making more and more downforce through the years oh this one's awesome it's like straight off the track too yeah this one right here uh is my final irock championship car uh, from 2005 um, and I told them I wanted it do not clean it I wanted all the rubber marks on it and uh, and everything just straight off the racetrack and they've been warned here to not clean it it's still got the rubber uh, thrown up you know underneath the hood from the tires and everything and uh, you can see here if you look really close you can see I did just a slight amount of pushing uh, this is from the Atlanta race, uh, but if you look in the back, I got a lot of push, pushes. I did a little bit of pushing, but I got a lot of pushes. From who? Oh, who knows? I don't even remember, but, uh, <laughs> that's pretty serious. Oh, yeah. We did some battles. Uh, IROC was really, really, really good for me. It's the pride, crown jewel of my career, and, um, and this, this was a, one of those million dollar paydays for me. Um, in 2005, I won my fifth uh, IROC championship. Uh, I think we won like, I think it was 13 uh, races and they only had four a year and I didn't get invited every year. I wasn't in it every year that I was in NASCAR because some years I didn't either win the champion. The champion always got uh, invited back but if, if, if you weren't the champion, you had to run about top three in NASCAR points to get invited. So I had some off years where I wasn't in that. So I wasn't, wasn't in it all the time, but uh, it's the only thing that I was able to win up Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> I think he won 11 races and probably four championships. So um, it's definitely, you know, the cars, People ask me, you know, why I had so much success, and I says, well, the car never runs out of gas, it never seems to blow up, and I never have a slow, slow pit stop, because there weren't any pit stops. So it was more just, you drive, you know, you go out on the racetrack and you, you leave it all right there. And there were less things to go wrong, uh, and I had a lot of things go wrong in my NASCAR career. I mean, so many races that we could have 
should have. Uh, but you know, every, you know, stuff. We we had a lot of problems. Believe me, um, there were a lot of races that got away from us. It is really cool that, like, you're the winningest driver of all of IROC history, aren't you? Yes. Like, yeah, that's that's why it's the crown jewel of my career, without a doubt. That is really neat knowing that. Um, does it like help you be less angry about those bad things that happened, knowing that when those variables were removed that maybe weren't even in your control that you were able to do this? I see it. It's a sense of pride for me that, that I accomplished what I did, and in, in especially in IROC, because I built my career on what I felt like was better race cars. Because when I raced against Larry Phillips, he was a better driver than me. But I could win if I made my car enough better. And then when I moved on to uh, you know racing ASA, it was the same deal with Triple. Triple was a better driver than me, probably. Surely. <laughs> uh, but I made my car better than his, so I got my share. And then when I went to NASCAR, I did the same thing. I know Dale Earnhardt was a better race car driver than me, but I got a few wins. I had my victories, and it was based on you know paying attention and making my car better. So uh, to be in equal cars and have you know the success that I had is really really special, and it, it does make me think you know, maybe. Maybe I was okay. Maybe I wasn't all, you know, race car knowledge. I thought I knew a lot about race cars and setting them up and bodies and aerodynamics and stuff, but maybe, you know, maybe that wasn't all of it. I don't know. I don't know. All I know, when I look back on my career, it's, it's a foggy, vague memory, and I don't believe that I did what I did. I can't believe that I got to race against Richard Petty and David Pearson um, and you know, that I got to race 40 years and have the career I had and the success I had because I never was good at anything else and I haven't been since I quit driving race cars any good at anything else. So it's hard for me to believe that I had the, you know, the little bit of success I had. It certainly isn't you know, on the on the level of Dale Earnhardt or Jeff Gordon, uh, you know, or Jimmy Johnson, or guys like that, uh, or you know, David Pearson and Richard Petty. But you know, I had had my day in the sun a few times, and that's pr pretty cool. I think your story is uh, extremely inspiring because of the way that it went. Like you just had this rise, and then. You got punched in the face and you had to start all the way back over, but you came back and still did it. I think a lot of people don't even know that that ever happened because I didn't know. And I think it's something that people need to, you know, look into more. Yeah, that was really good for me. As, as painful as it was, and it almost broke me, uh, spiritually and mentally almost destroyed me. But I only... I wouldn't be the person that I was in NASCAR, if it, and, and I wouldn't be the person I am today if that hadn't happened. I think it was important that it happened to me because uh, you know it really made me appreciate the success that I had, made me appreciate Jack Roush. When he gave me my second chance, I stayed with that guy for 19 years, you know, when you know, there were opportunities to drive the 28 car and, and uh, multiple, multiple different opportunities, you know, different times that I could have moved over to the 28 car. And, and uh, I stayed with Jack because he gave me that second chance. And because, you know, he let, you know, he let his drivers have a hand in the direction of the cars and how they were, you know, for years, how they were built. You know, in the early years, you know, uh, I had a good bit of input. Um, in the last few years, I had a little bit less because it was already starting to get a little bit more 
engineer driven, but uh, you know that era was a golden era. Uh, you know, from the '80s to the 2000s of motorsports because things were changing all the time and there were so little rules that when you would do something, you know, that really gave you an advantage, they would see, you know, the, they would see that and make a rule against it. Mm -hmm. So you were always a, a rule maker. And that's what I always wanted to be. You know, I wanted to be out front. And that's one of the things that really made me the racer that I was. There was two, two individuals prior to me getting to NASCAR that really forced me to up my game. And that was Junior Hanley and Gary Ballou. Those two guys were very important uh, because they really, really were progressive and out there. And uh, those guys made me step my game up. Whenever you were like coming back up, did you ever have any kind of method to what you were doing? Are you feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm getting a little too good here. I need to go somewhere else so I can put myself back at the bottom of the ladder and like, or if, I feel like I'm not learning anything here. I need to change it up. That's spot on, really. 74, the first year I raced, you know, I was learning so much. I was so young. So I stayed in that division for 75. And then 75, we had a lot of success. So it was certainly time to move on to late models from the six cylinder division for 76. By late 76, we were having to travel out of state to find competition that pushed us and made us really step our game up. And at that point, having to travel that far, there wasn't an asphalt track in Arkansas. So, uh, you know, we had been on exclusively dirt, but at that point in time, by end of 76 and traveling all out of state, it might, we might as well, the Daytona 500 wasn't on dirt, it was on asphalt. So it's time to go to pavement racing for 77. And, you know, that was a big step and to go through the track championships at Springfield, Missouri and Fort Smith, Arkansas and ASA Rookie of the Year to ASA Championship in 78, 79 and 80, those three years back to back, yes, it was time to step up to NASCAR. Problem was, I'd never been in the garage area of a NASCAR race. I'd never, I'd just been in a few grandstands of NASCAR races and I didn't know what I was getting into. So I waded into it deep and it swallowed me the first go round. So that's kind of what happened. In 81, I did five races with a cup car, built my own cup car, just like my little late model. It was way ahead of its time. And uh, we, we, you know, we only raced it once every month or every two months, I only raced it five times. So we were able to prepare and out prepare a competition. And so we, Heck, we sat on two poles with that car out of five races. The third race I entered, I sat on the pole, hmm. third NASCAR race. And uh, we finished third and seventh with that car with my little ASA late model team, racing against Richard Petty and, and uh, all those guys. I mean, it was like crazy. But the following year, I went full time in 82. And I was not prepared for that. And we didn't have the funding for that. I didn't have the per personnel. We just we just failed. After that, I mean, that was, uh, you know, it, it took me a few years to get back to NASCAR and get back with Jack Roush, who could give me an opportunity to work with great people like Steve Mill and Robin Pemberton. Uh, and, you know, we had to build a NASCAR team from scratch, but in our second year, we got, got our first win and uh, it was a dream come true from there. It was, uh, we just built the team stronger and better and then multiple cars. You know, it was just a single car team for several years and teammates and multiple cars. And, uh, and then Matt Kenseth was able to bring them their first championship and then Kurt Busch just a year or two later. And so um, it was, even though I didn't get a championship, it made me proud to have, you know, Jack Roush have an owner's championship uh, because of what he meant to me. What is uh, this car over here? So the story behind this car, uh, I don't think I, uh, I think I had a winless season in 2001 and I was afraid that I'd never win another race. So 2002, um, 
I switched teams with uh, Kurt Busch. So I had Kurt's young guys and Kurt had my veteran guys. Uh, we felt like that would be uh, better for Kurt and I both there at Roush Racing. I'd had a winless season in 2001. Was afraid I wasn't ever gonna win another race. Uh, loved Charlotte, was in the Noble Five for the Charlotte race eligible for a million dollar bonus. And Ben Leslie, the crew chief, uh, told me one day at the shop about two months before the Charlotte race, he said, we're gonna build you a car for Charlotte. We're gonna hang the body on it like you want. We're gonna make a whole lot of front downforce like you want. And we're gonna win that no bull five race at Charlotte. And I'm like, cool, sounds good. <laughs> you guys do that and I'll take half of my part of the winnings and share with the race team. And uh, we did it. <laughs> we did it. So this is the car, uh, JR, I think it's JR44. It was the car that we won uh, Charlotte with. And uh, does it still have the, the body on it the way it was, or has it, it been rebodied and reused? No, this is the body the way it was. And interesting fact, if you come to the front, I like I like opposite race cars than Matt Kenseth. Matt Kenseth liked low downforce front and a lot of side force uh, cars. I like my cars with a ton of front downforce. And so, if you look real close, this thing is cheated up pretty good. It's got a real long, low nose on it, and the nose is scooted to the right. It has a humongous left front fender, you know, on it and not a lot of right front fender. They took it to the wind tunnel. They made a ton of front downforce on it. And, uh, and I like cars like that. One of the things though, we were traveling the car quite a bit and late in the race, the ductwork had been dragging the racetrack and it drug a hole in the ductwork for the radiator. It still seemed to turn pretty good, but it got awfully hot. If you look at the pictures, photographs like this one up here, Victory Lane, you can see my face is pretty red. It was pretty hot uh, that night at Charlotte, but we just barely beat Matt Kenseth to win that race, but it was a very, very sweet victory. And this, this photograph from Victory Lane almost brings tears to my eyes because I never absorbed anything. When I won a race, I would be standing in Victory Lane already worrying about how could we win next week's race? What can we do to the car? What are we gonna do to win? I never soaked it in, really took it in. And this picture shows what I didn't see when I was there, like all the coke splattered on Matt's shirt, him holding the million dollar bonus check. Uh, he was so excited uh, that we won a million dollars. He thought we were rich. <laughs> and uh, and then to see this whole race team and to see how wet, you know, like Arlene's blouse has gotten wet, you know. I mean, we were sure enough celebrating here. And if you look at the face of these guys here on this race team, many of these guys have never been to Victory Lane in the Cup Series. This was a young group of guys, uh, and uh, for a lot of them, it was their first win. And it was really, really special. Do you uh, regret not absorbing things like that more? Or do you think that you would not have been able to function without keeping your mind forward? So I do regret it. And I regret not having uh, more fun. Uh, I could have been, I could have absorbed it and still probably had the success I had. Uh, I could have absorbed it more and I could have just lightened up a little bit. And, and uh, I, I was telling Kenny Schrader, just because Kenny knows me really well, he was there most of the time. And I told Kenny, I said, I really regret not having more fun. And he said, yeah, you know, you would have still had as much success if you would have just lightened up a little bit. That's my personality. I was serious. I was dead serious, you know. I was serious. I wanted to win and I didn't want to look away. I just, I never wanted to take my eye off the target. And I felt like that was my, uh, that was my edge. That I knew more, I had seen more, absorbed more of everything, you know, about the cars, about the track, about the tires, you know, 
uh, about the setups, you know, and all that stuff. You know, I just kept it in my mind all the time and right there in my focus and never let my eyes look, you know, uh, very far off of that target. How did, uh, was that like a learning curve for the people around you to kind of like learn that you are kind of like matter of fact or short because you're focused on something else and like did people, were people ever off put by that? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was not, uh, over overly social um to you know i was pretty direct uh, my guys uh, david levendahl that worked for me um he came to work you know when i moved from here from batesville to, to north liberty indiana i took banjo with me banjo Grimm and and david levendahl and david uh nicknamed me uh, the prick of misery uh and uh there was another one too. I can't. Remember. I can't think of what it was. But yeah, I mean, I was pretty tough. I I was demanding. I wanted them to work uh, as many hours and as hard as I did, and to care as much as I did. I, you know, I think the hours that we spent would have had to have been spent to be successful. But I think you could have lightened up. I, I you know I think it could have lightened up some and and still had the success. And you know that is one regret that I have. Um, is, you know, just not having more fun along the way. Hmm. I'll remember that. This car over here um, is the first race car uh, that Jack Roush gave me. Uh, we had legendary success with uh, Win dixie as a sponsor. This was the last race for Win dixie as sponsorship. It was down at Homestead. And this is straight off the racetrack. You know, we led most of the race. I thought we were going to win the race. Should thought we should have won the race, but Jeff Gordon uh, drove up and passed us late in the race and won the race. I never even understood. I never looked at the car. I just figured we just got beat, right? So when we we unloaded the car here and lifted the hood, if you'll have a close look, the cord's in the right front. Oh, That's yeah. why we lost the race because the right front corded on the last set of tires and. Uh, so, I have an excuse. <laughs> and how, how many years had gone by before you noticed that? Uh, it was probably a year or so. And just lifted the hood and there it was. But that's, that's the tires that were on it. And uh, like I say, it's right off the racetrack. And uh, we had a lot of success. Uh, that car was hard to be anywhere, anytime when that thing unloaded. The competition knew that they, they had their work cut out for it. Uh, to be able to beat that car. The yellow chassis is really cool. I wish they still painted chassis different colors. It's yeah, like, this was still back before this, you know, really put a lot of emphasis on the safety. This seat was the seat that I raced ASA with. Uh, Dixiana built these seats for me um, and I ran them in ASA and then I ran them in NASCAR and Cup and everything and they're a flat eighth inch uh, aluminum with no bracing. So if you reach over in here right now, you could just push the rim. I mean, it's, wow. When I would hit, that thing would open wide, you know, wide open like that. I've seen those rib things way over there like that. And uh, you can see the head, I mean, yeah, it's crazy to see. I'm lucky that I survived the tire wars in, in these seats, you know, because the, we blew a lot of right fronts and hit, took some really hard licks before we really ever got those, uh, you know, really st stiff seats and, uh, and all the, you know, the Hans and all the restraints and all that stuff. I, I really feel lucky to be, be able to say that I survived all that. Was there, is there like one specific crash where you're like, that, that could have been really bad? The one, the one that I know would have killed me was Talladega. It was around 94. We're in the trial. Guys wrecked in front of me and hit me in the right front. And I turned sideways. It breaks a brake rotor, so I've got zero brakes. And I'm hung sideways and can't. I can't get it to change. It just stays sideways and it goes down and there's a guardrail. 
and I'm coming at that guardrail probably 150 miles an hour. Uh, and I'd had a friend killed by a guardrail, Larry Deachins, uh, and I was very scared of guardrails coming up inside the car. And I thought, you know, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. And I went through the guardrail, just never even slowed me down, went right through it and into a chain link fence. And of course, you know, the guardrail, didn't, it wasn't even a hard hit. So we leave there, everything's fine. I'm, you know, I'm hurt a little bit, but not injured. And so we come back for the next race and I roll out from practice and I look over there and that where that guardrail was is a concrete wall, hmm. not survivable. That, that hit would not have been survivable. The one thing that I was so afraid of probably saved me, which was the guardrail, you know, just being able to go right through it. Wow, that's crazy. It is crazy to think about. Did you, were you like apprehensive, a little, a little bit skittish after that, or did you just kind of process it and move on? Oh, uh, process it and move on. I, did, I, I think I've seen some other drivers say this before, but in, especially in a dangerous era, which we're not in now, because the safety has come so far, but in the dangerous eras, like, you know, whenever, uh, 80s and 90s, you always figure that it's not gonna be you. You know, that it's dangerous, but you've got control of things because you're driving and you've got control of it. Speaking of technology and safety, my last big hoorah, I guess. Uh, winning five races and finishing second in the points at 50 years old. It's not something that happens every day. You know, all five of the trophies are over here in the corner. Uh, old faded uniform and, <laughs> and whatnot. Were you having more fun by this point? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because I had thought I'd given it up. You know, I was. I had already uh, done two partial schedules in 07 and 08 and had no intention of ever racing for a championship again. Rick Hendrick kept on me about coming and driving for him. And I said, I'll come and run 24 races. I'm not gonna drive the full schedule. And after, the, after turning him down twice, uh, the third time he asked me, I just got to thinking, daydreaming about what it would be like to win one more time. Just one more time. So I talked it over with Arlene and we decided to give it a whirl. I don't know the history of this, this car, this particular car. It's more of a, a, a symbol. Whereas, you know, this, the rest of the cars here, the, these four cars in the circle, they all represent wins and milestones in my career. Did you absorb more of the having fun in the Bush car, or was it the same type of seriousness on both levels? Same seriousness. This car um, is uh, pretty darn cool for me because one of the first years, I think, that they were paying a million dollars to win the all-star race in Charlotte. Um, and this was a race where, you know, I, I didn't have a dominant car, but I had a good car. I always hate when somebody says, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I planned that move right there and I did, you know, and that, you know, it was the right move. Your move is only right if everybody else does the right thing to make it right. You know, if you make a choice to make a move on the racetrack and everybody happens to do something different and makes that move not work, then you're not smart, <laughs> you know? Mm. And I also believe that you're not truly not that smart if you do something and, and it works because you don't have any control a lot of times of what everybody else does. Well, this particular night, every move I made on the racetrack worked. It's one of those nights when, dang man, I, every, t every time I chose a lane or every time I made a pass or every time I made a move, it was the right one. I really felt like I had a hand in winning that race as a driver not just as a car and taking the car and winning, but you know, and I know that I was lucky because I know I don't control what everyone else does. 
but it just felt good for everything that you know to be right for once instead of doing yeah. something stupid it's yeah. even cooler that 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 happened with the the throwback paint scheme yes and this is the same chassis as that yes like that it's just is, restored uh, that is the chassis actually uh what happened was uh Jack sold it to an ARCA team, and it raced several years in ARCA. I got a phone call. It's the car you won uh, the All-Star with, All-Star race in 2005. Uh, would you be interested in it? Sign me up. So I bought it from him, and I had it, you know, repainted, restored, really, because it was uh, kind of raggedy, and restored it. And, put it in here so this is the chassis that that won that race who does all the the recreation of the graphics i'd have to look it up but somebody in 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 north carolina i never saw the car until it showed up here like this it's a bill ryan yeah yes what's the story on this car here and that's another just kind of a symbol car of what we did uh i don't know the history behind this particular car we, we, you know, we won about five poles and i was 53 years old so get this we're about to go on a field trip with mark to look at some of the old buildings and historic places around here that he had i don't know associations with i'm not exactly sure what he's going to show us but we're going to hop in his uh his denali and see where we go 